Worried about a calamity or extinction level event? Wolf Starchild is your guy. So in this kit, we will start a fire today with, with no matches whatsoever, simply using a knife. And Wolf, and yeah, that's his real name, he's a prepper and spends a lot of time teaching others how to survive the worst. A huge paradigm shift happened during the pandemic. Shall we make some fire? All right, so make your first fire. Let's see if you can light it up. There we go. There we go, very nice. The people that came for our courses to take courses like learning how to split wood, learning how to survive, learning how to be out in the woods, then shifted to, oh my God, I'm scared. I need to, I need these skills to protect my family. And what, and I mean, what are they thing. thinking? Like, most of those people Societal were like, collapse? Society collapse is what they were concerned about. Two, one, fire. The prepper movement isn't new rooted in Cold War fears of an apocalypse. But recent big fires and floods, civil disorder, plus the war in Ukraine, have put the movement on the radar, encompassing more than just a fringe element. Look no further than Costco, which sells a prepper's pallet of food for a year. This is gonna to sound totally reasonable to some people, like a thing they should do, and others are gonna think you're crazy. That's right, well, uh, the, neither is wrong. <laughs> okay, okay. Indeed, there are still guns and ammo survivalists, sometimes with roots in the far right. They fear a civil war, believe government itself is the threat. Is that the community today? There's people like that in it, absolutely there is. Um, Self-reliance as a whole attracts that type of person to it. It definitely does. Um, and that's not to say that certainly everybody is like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, for me, prepping and the prepping that we teach is practical, right? Again, your car goes off the road, you're now in a prepping situation. Right? But for all preppers, there are limits. The first rule of prepping is we don't talk about prepping. And why is that? Um, the reason is, is because the, we, uh, many preppers believe it makes them a target. The question is, when does being prepared become being paranoid? In Northern BC, Alicia Atkins says living rural means being prepared. She's happy to show us her wood pile with years of fuel, a large greenhouse, and a freezer full of meat. Show me what you got. So we've got, um, we've got some deer burger here. Lots of deer, lots of moose. Yeah rows of canned food, sprouts which will produce over the winter. Seeds, she says, are her most valuable possession. Tomatoes, corn, beans, peas, uh, cabbages, lettuce. What is this to you? I know it's a... Security. Oh. Security, yeah. So these are definitely very valuable to me. Could you do 10 years here? We have our heat in place, uh, hunting's available, fishing's available. We have access to water, we could do 10 years. Alicia worries about food shortages, economic collapse too. Her plan though, involves her neighbors. Because we do rely on our community. There's yeah. a lot of trade and barter that go around here. Yeah, tell me about that. So for example, if I want livestock, I can grow fruit trees that produce food, but I might not have the pigs. So I can find someone that does have the pigs and trade them fruit trees. Good job. Yep. So sit pretty. Trade sit and pretty. barter also yep. cuts government out of the exactly. transaction. Exactly. But for all the stockpiling and planning, Come on. Show your muscles. you got it, you got it. Alicia thinks she's less prepper, more of a homesteader, relying on herself, her family, and her land. So what are you? Prepared, I guess, <laughs> which is kind of the same as a prepper. Um, sustainable, self-sufficient. I don't know, what's the stigma around that? When, when I think of a stereotypical prepper, I think of someone that has a bomb shelter and <laughs> is, is uh, collecting artillery and, or, you know, they're, they're almost militant about it. Yeah. Um, and know. they're ready to cut off from the world. They're ready to cut off, yeah. yeah. Is that and, you? No. 
They exist, though, like in the U.S., with underground fortified bunkers. Change the image that we have as crazy people. Paul Rodriguez is worried about getting robbed, so doesn't want to show his face. Not unusual in the community. So, I'm a normal guy. Um, I go to the gym, I got a mortgage. Paul's an urban prepper. He lives in Toronto, and it was the city's ice storm in 2013 where power was cut for days that convinced Paul prepping was imperative. I was at home with my power generator, watching DVD movies, cooking my food, and then my neighbor was struggling. He got a baby. He couldn't boil the water for the formula for the baby. So I told him, buddy, I'll give you an extension. Go ahead. And what's this that's strapped oh. here? So this is in a scanner that I use to, to get my local news. My EMS, my police, uh, firefighters. There are so many news that they don't get to the TV. So local stuff. So it's my, like situational awareness for that's you. That's it. Yeah. yeah. We got the first aid for minor cuts. So you fill it up with water. You put this face to the sun and it gets hot. Paul's got a go bag ready the instant he needs it, complete with an ax. This is if we, I need to carry a gun. This is how. He didn't bring his guns to meet us, but he has them. Everyone in the house has a go bag. My kids, my wife, myself. His biggest fear? Riots, even nuclear accident or attack. And prepping is an entire lifestyle. So it's Wolf thinks everyone has a little prepper in them. You can get as deep into it as you want, so you can be like the super hardcore off-grid guy who owns a bug out bus, all makes his own clothes. Yeah, but that, okay. <laughs> that, that's also that, me. That is you. <laughs> yeah. An investment many preppers will say, expecting they'll need it.